All right, that's three o'clock. Let's, uh, let's dive right in. So welcome, welcome to NDC Oslo. Um, I'm not in Oslo, you're probably not in Oslo, but let's just do this. Do this. My name is Johnny, uh, Johnny Hoibergs. I'm from Belgium, so I'm now comfort comfortably in my home in Belgium. Uh, and I want to talk to you today about uh, quantum computing. I've called my session a deep dive. Uh, I will give you an introduction into quantum computing, but I also will dive a little bit deeper into what's behind it and what kind of algorithms um, you can write using uh, quantum computing. Um, as I said before, my name is uh, Johnny Hoibergs. Uh, you can find me on GitHub. You can find me on Twitter. Um, I am a consultant and I work for a consultancy firm in Belgium, which is called Involved because we only have involved consultants uh, we'd like to think of. Uh, my main job is doing .NET backend development. Um, so I'm a .NET developer and architect uh, for, for different companies. Uh, my biggest customer uh, at the moment is uh, Deloitte in Belgium. So I'm doing a couple of uh, ar architectural uh, projects for them. Um, so actually on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't have anything to do with quantum computing. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was actually sitting um, at, at your side. I was attending a conference in Belgium, Tecorama. Um, there was somebody talking about quantum computing, and it struck me. I was like, "Oh, this is this is this is something great." I don't understand anything during the uh, presentation, or at least I, I didn't understand most of it. So I decided to dig deep uh, myself. So I really wanted to know what it's all about. And I decided to 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 look into that. So that's uh, already a couple of years ago. Um, today, I've uh, I've had a lot of fun with quantum computing just by figuring things out, looking into it. And actually, my goal of this presentation is to explain quantum computing to developers like me in a way that they understand. So I'm not going to throw uh, difficult math or physics uh, at your faces. I just want to um, explain from a developer to a developer what quantum computing is all about so what will you do after this session so the session only takes an hour so we can only do so much in one hour of time um, so i hope you will be able to um, explain why quantum computing actually matters um, i i hope you will study more about quantum computing yourself so, so just take the time to read about it to ex uh, experiment with it um, there's lots of material online and uh, that you can use um, i also hope that you can understand the basics about quantum computing of course um, that you will be able to run quantum al algorithms using IBM Q Experience and Microsoft Q Sharp. There's many more options for you to, to do quantum computing from different companies. Um, the one I'm going to use today is IBM Q Experience because it's a very visual experience of how to write a circuit. Um, and then Microsoft Q Sharp, which is more a programming language to do uh, quantum algorithms. Um, hopefully, but I'm not sure, um, you will be able to decipher quantum algorithms. So maybe some algorithms you will be able to uh, decipher uh, with the knowledge uh, you will receive today. Maybe others uh, are going to be a little bit um, out of your reach, uh, even for me. Um, are you going to use quantum computing tomorrow? Probably not yet, um, because we're still we're still working on the physical implementations for quantum computers. There are already companies that are working uh, quantum. They're they're they're, they're doing experiments, but it, from day to day development, we're probably not going to do it tomorrow. Are we going to use quantum computing in the next decade? Not sure. Um, maybe, maybe not. It depends on how different companies uh, make implementations of a physical quantum computer. If that works out fine, then maybe in the next decade, but maybe there's there's some other uh, hurdles we first need to uh, cross. So why, why in God's name would we would we want to do quantum computing? Well, there are still a lot of problems out there um, that cannot be solved by our regular computers. Um, there's still many, many uh, problems that just uh, need too much uh, too many resources, too much power, and that we just don't have the capabilities to do. Also, we're we're making CPUs uh, faster and faster and faster um, by making them smaller and smaller, so we can just cram more um, transistors into them. But they also have their physical limits. We can't keep getting smaller without actually having unwanted quantum side effects um, because of that scale. So when we make CPUs. Uh, smaller and have more uh, transistors inside of them, we also make them less stable. So that's an issue we can't keep this up forever. 
um, and and actually we we used computing power to solve many re real life uh, problems, um, even problems in nature. But why? why are we doing that on a classical computer because nature is quantum by itself so maybe we just need a quantum system to simulate a quantum world uh, and that's probably uh, more realistic to do so uh, why quantum computing again there's still a lot of problems uh, that we have that are not solvable by regular computers or classical computers um, and i have a very um, simple example of that um, there's there's like uh, a thing if you take a piece of paper, and I have a piece of paper right here, um, in this piece of paper, if you fold it double, it actually has double uh, the thickness. So in our, the, the original thickness for this sheet of paper is about 0.1 millimeter. So if you fold it double, it's 0.2 millimeters. And if you fold that double again, it's 0.4 millimeters. And if you keep on doing that, if you keep on folding this paper for 42 times, so 42, 42 is a very comprehensible number. It's not, it's not a lot. 42 times. So just fold your piece of paper 42 times. The thickness from that piece of paper will reach the distance from the Earth to the Moon. And that's that just blows your mind. 42 is such a small number, but 2 to the power of 42 will be the thickness of um, the total block of paper, which is half a million, half a million kilometers, which is just crazy. And that's the that's the issue with computing. Maybe you, as a developer, you, you write an algorithm and you throw some data against that algorithm and it, it, it completes uh, your algorithm in just a few seconds. But then you just um, add a lot more data to that uh, and all of a sudden your algorithm takes a thousand years to complete. And that's just crazy. Uh, sometimes your, your problem is, is so complex that if you just add a little bit more data, it, it becomes unsolvable by a classic computer. So this is why uh, quantum computing hopefully uh, will be a solution uh, to this. So quantum computing is based on quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is a field in physics that describes uh, different behaviors on a quantum scale, and quantum scale means a very small scale. So think uh, atoms, think um, electrons, stuff like that. Um, so very small scale, and on that scale, there are some 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 weird things going on. And quantum mechanics specifically talks about this. Uh, kind of behavior. Um, superposition and entanglement are two of these um, mechanics that we are actually going to use in quantum computing to hopefully solve our problem with um, exponential, exponentially large uh, problems. So let me try to explain um, quantum mechanics uh, based on uh, some experiment that has actually been performed by a, um, a scientist called Thomas Young in the early 1800s. So the early 1800s, it's a very long time ago. Um, I think this experiment is just is just crazy. Um, I'm, I hope I can just show you or explain to you by doing some drawings. So the double slit experiment uh, as executed by Thomas Young in the early 1800s was actually to prove that light is a wave. So today we all know this because we, we learned that in school. So light is a wave and the frequency of that wave is actually the color of the light. And then the amplitude of that wave is basically um, the brightness of that light. Um, but in that uh, time, in the early 1800s, people really didn't, didn't know what light was. So he just created an experiment, Thomas Young created an experiment to prove that light is a wave. And the experiment was as follows. So I will draw this and instead of light, I will talk about water because water is easier for us to grasp than light because we can see water, we can see movements in water, it's more difficult for light. So he actually had an, an, uh, uh, an experiment that used like a, a box. And inside of this box, um, at the end, was a wall. And he used that wall to see the end result of the light. Okay, you can shine a laser light on, on top of a wall and you can see the result uh, from that. So we're going to do this with water. And then halfway, the halfway uh, in between the, the, this edge and the, the, the wall, he actually made a barrier. And this barrier had two uh, gaps, two slits like this. Yeah, my drawing is, is, is very nice here. I'm a, I'm a good drawer like this. So there's a barrier, there's two gaps inside of this barrier. 
um, and then there's the, the box at the end. So he was going to shine light um, through the barrier, but we're going to do it with regular waves. So imagine you're standing right here on the red dot and you just shove, you just push the edge of the box to create waves in water. So what you will get is nice little waves, just like uh, on, the, on the beach um, in straight lines. And those straight li lines will hit the barrier. And then when they hit the barrier, the, the wave will actually be, be stopped by the barrier, but not at the two slits, so not in the two gaps. In the two gaps, the waves will continue their, their path and they will continue their pa path outwards. So it's like a half a cir circle. So this, the waves will go like this. So from one um, gap, it looks like this. And then from the, on from the other gap, it's the same thing. And as you can see, those waves, they're, they, they are actually going to meet each other. They're going to interfere with each other. And this will actually influence um, the way they will hit the barrier in the end. Because in the middle, right in the middle, the amplitude will be highest and the waves will be high. And then on, on some spots, there will be no waves because the, the, the phases of the waves will actually cancel each other out. If a high wave and a low wave, if they meet each other, they will cancel each other out. So there's no, there's nothing really hitting uh, the back wall. So actually there's there's going to be a pattern like this. And it's, it's going to diminish um, if you go to the right-hand side and it's going to diminish if you're going to the left-hand side. This is because, of course, the, the waves have to travel a larger distance so they will get lower uh, in the end because they, they lose their, their energy. And this is what they call an interference pattern. So it's a pattern caused by interference because the two uh, waves that are created by the two slits, they will interfere with each other. They will create... Uh, in interference basically so the constructive interference uh, providing a higher wave and destructive interference cancelling out uh, the waves and this is a pattern so thomas young knew this and he said okay if light is a wave light would show the same end result and it, and he was right it did so light does exactly the same thing there's actually a there's actually a thing you can do if you take a, a compact disc so the the cd the ones you can write on yourself um and you peel off the, the, the protective layer and you'd shine a laser through it, you will see the same uh, pattern on your wall if you turn the lights off because the CD also has very small gaps. And if you shine the light through those gaps, you will see the same um, interference pattern. Okay, so that's basically the, the, the double slit experiment. So it proved that light was a wave because it created the same uh, pattern. Now, we go um, into the future, which is now the past. Um, and in the 1970s, um, this experiment was actually uh, done all over again, but it was not done using light, it was done using electrons. So they were going to shoot electrons to the same wall. So we have the same thing. We have the same wall in, in the back. We have the same barrier, so I'm not going to draw the barrier in 3D for now. And here was like a, an electron gun, it was shooting electrons. And they were shooting them one after each other, very quickly. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And as you would expect, um, some of the electrons will hit the barrier, other electrons will pass through one of the two slits, um, and they will actually hit the wall in the end. So what you would expect is to have two um, impact locations um, just after where the slits are, basically. But that's not what happened. Um, actually, those electrons were creating exactly the same interference pattern as they did with um the um as with light or or water so this was weird and then they thought okay maybe that's that's logical because of course when we shoot many uh, electrons at the same time they will bounce off of each other uh, they will actually create the same interference pattern because they just bounce off of each other so they they redid the experiment um and they shot those um electrons one by one and they had a lot of time in between each shot and they shot them one by one. Um, and what, that, what they saw was, again, the same interference pattern, which is very weird. And that's, that's what, what quantum really is, it's weird. So they shot the electrons one by one. They couldn't interfere with each other because they were only shot one by one. And still they were making the same interference pattern. Um, and they really couldn't understand this. So what they did is they, they add like a little camera and that camera was looking at one of the two slits. 
and they were just checking which of the electron, where, where is the electron uh, passing through the first slit or the second slit. And from the moment they put on the camera, the interference pattern disappeared. And actually the electrons only hit the two distinct locations behind the two slits. And this was, this was weird 100%. Because when they put on the camera, the electrons would behave like they expect. And then if they remove the camera again, they would create the interference pattern again. And that's where the theory of quantum uh, mechanics actually comes from. Um, it looks like the electron from the moment we shoot it, it loses all connection to reality. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. It only exists as a probability wave, again, as a wave. So even if we shoot particles, quantum particles, one by one, they actually lose their link with reality and they create a, a wave of them of, the, of their own, which is a wave of probability. And that wave of probability will tell um, nature that the electron can basically go 50% one slit or 50% the other slit. Um, and because that is a wave, the wave can actu will actually be split up in, in two separate waves when, when it passes through those two slits and it will interfere with itself. So that's why when they say that a quantum object um, is uh, in superposition, it's, it's basically everywhere at the same time and it interferes with itself because it hasn't made a decision on where it should be. It only makes that decision if it's coming back into contact with our reality. So when you put a camera on it, you actually force the electron to come back into reality and then it decides in that moment in time if it's going to go through that slit or the other one. And it's the same thing when it hits the wall. When it hits the wall, the probability wave collapses and the electron decides where exactly um, it will hit. So very, very cool experiment. Uh, lots of cool stuff uh, to watch about that uh, on the internet if you're um, interested in that so very cool so that is that is also what's 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 called um, quantum um, superposition so there are properties on different kinds of objects uh, quantum objects small small objects um, that can have multiple values multiple states but they can also have those states at the same time this is basically the 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 wave function that says okay the probability of that property being in a specific uh, being a specific value is so much percent. So that's what superposition is. Um, then there's something else called um, entanglement. So entanglement is is basically if you have a quantum object, you can actually entangle that, link that to another quantum object. And if you look at one of the one of their their properties, that property will actually be the same or opposite um, in the two objects. And this is something that is um, is proven by experiments uh, a couple of years ago by a, a Chinese research team. Um, they call their experiment the quantum experiment at space scale. And they have a satellite um, hovering uh, the Earth. Uh, it's, it's not very far out. I think it's uh, a little more than 100 kilometers out. Um, and this satellite has a device that can actually split a photon in half. So a photon is the, the basic element of light. So actually we know light is a wave, but actually light also consists out of uh, tiny elements, tiny, tiny particles called photons. And if you take one of those photons and you split it in half, so then you have two photons with half the energy, um, the chances of them being entangled are, are quite high. And what they did is, okay, if they sent one element to some lab in China, and that's what you can see in the image from the laser. Um, so one laser they used to transport the uh, entangled photon to a lab in China. And then the other laser they used to transport the other entangled uh, item to a lab in Austria. And here they uh, could see that if one of them observed the element, the other element in the other lab had the exact, the exact same uh, property or the opposite property, dep depending on how you look like it. So it seems that those two particles are actually entangled. Um, and it doesn't mean that they decided beforehand what their values were, because they were in superposition the moment they were sent. So they weren't really in any position. They were just some probability wave that said, okay, we can be in both positions at the same time, um, but we're not deciding on right now. Only from the moment that a scientist looks at it in the lab, will the other um, object also decide to take on the same state or the opposite state. And, and this is proven um, by, by, by many experiments that it actually works. 
And scientists really don't know how this works. They know that it, that it exists, they know that it works, but they don't know how, because the two objects are not communicated to each other. It's like they're linked somehow, but they also proven that the co communication, it's not really communication, there is no communication, but for us, it seems like they're communicating. They also proven that the communication is faster than light. It's even instant. There is no delay, it's instant. When you look, when you observe one item, the other item, immediately um, reacts to that, which is just crazy. Um, so that's entanglement. So superposition and entanglement are two of these crazy quantum concepts that we can use in quantum computing to actually create algorithms that hopefully can do a lot more than what a, a classical computer uh, can do. So why would we use it? Um, well, there are, there are many domains that have problems that are too difficult um, to solve. Uh, an example is security. So today we have secu security in place based on public-private key encryption. Um, this kind of encryption is actually very simple um, in its base. Um, there's like a public key and there's a private key. So the public key can actually be used to encrypt the, your data and it can be shared for, for all of the world. So all of the world can have access to this public key and it can use that key to encrypt data. And then somebody else has a private key, and hopefully this is this is one person that has a private key, and he's the only one that has that private key, and he's the only one that can actually decrypt that data. So, in essence, um, the public key is just a very very large number, very large number, and the private key are two factors, two prime factors to create this number. So you have two prime factors, and if you multiply them with each other, you have a, a, a very large number, which is, your, which is your public key. And it's very easy if you have the private key, the two separate numbers, it's very easy to uh, multiply them together and get the public key from that. But vice versa is very difficult. When you have the very large number, um, factorizing that large number into its original prime factors for a classical computer, is not doable. It, it just doesn't work. We can write algorithms, we can write brute force algorithms that will just try find, finding prime numbers and multiplying them to each other, um, but it will still take one hundreds or thousands of years for a classical computer to reach, um, to reach a solution for that. So that's the reason why encryption works, why public-private key encryption works. So this is exactly the problem we are trying to solve with quantum computing. We want to create algorithms that are going to be able to do factorization of such large numbers. And it's it's looking quite good. The algorithm exists. We just don't have the physical quantum computer that is stable enough to actually do it. So from the moment that we that we have such a, a, a quantum computer, um, basically that kind of encryption is going to be obsolete. But then of course, we have uh, other kinds of encryption we can use um, instead. Like uh, for quantum specifically, there's quantum key distribution, which is basically creating entangled um, entangled passwords, um, and there's also some some other uh, security things we can do uh, in the classical world. So for security, it's already already a big thing. Um, of course, also drug development. So when pharmaceutical companies are trying to create a drug, um, they have a very hard time simulating that drug on their computers because in order to test a drug, it would be very easy to just just to create a model on your computer, a, a real life model of a human, and if you add that drug to that humans, um, see what, what happens. But the reason they, they do testing on animals is because we don't have computers that are um, capable of uh, simulating a complex system like a human being. There's so many things going on on a molecular level inside of our body that we just don't have the capacity to, to recreate that. And again, with quantum computing, we can hopefully have algorithms that are able to do things like gene sequencing or protein folding um, that can handle that much data and that much sim simulated data um, to solve these problems for us. Also, our body, the molec molecules in our body, they, they act in a quantum way because they are quantum by nature. So when we try to simulate them, it would should be easier to simulate them um, using quantum instead of uh, classical computers. And then also artificial intelligence, the same story. Um, artificial intelligence actually works on large sets of data. Um, so by learning from, like machine learning, learning from large data, um, 
artificial intelligence could, could have only fast feedback when it's able to process all of that data very fast. Uh, and again, a classical computer just doesn't have the capability to do that. And if you want to emulate a human mind, for example, that's just not possible. So again, quantum computing hopefully can help us using those quantum concepts. So that's uh, still a bit abstract. Um, I can tell you quantum computing will hopefully solve this and you can or can't believe me. Um, so I'm going to try to go a little bit deeper into how quantum computing works, what are the different uh, objects we, we can use and how can we translate that into a programming language. But first, maybe the most important question um, for quantum computing, uh, I think everyone's already ha uh, having this question in their mind, can it run crisis? Very importantly, we all want to know this. If we create quantum computers, can we run a game on it? Um, here I need, uh, I want to tell you that a quantum computer is going to be something completely different than a classical computer. Um, a quantum computer is only going to work or going to work best for very specific problems. So if we have a very difficult problem, um, that we need to solve, we can have a specific algorithm created for that problem and then run it on a quantum computer. But just regular classical stuff like a computer game, for example, um, we're going to keep keep it on, on, a, on a classical computer because classical computers are fine to do stuff like that. Um, probably in the future when quantum computing becomes a thing, um, it's going to be a combination of both. We're going to run parts of an algorithm on a classical computer and other parts on a quantum computer, and then we can we can merge the end results into whatever uh, we need. So I guess quantum computing will be something that lives in the cloud and we can use it as a, as a service, um, basically. So what does it look like? So for a quantum computer, the, the concept is actually the same as a classical computer. A classical computer works with bits that can either be zero or one, and a quantum computer is going to going to use the exact same concept because we already know this. Um, we're not going to call it a bit, we're going to call it a qubit, which stands for quantum bit. Um, and it's also going to have those same values, zero and one. But those values will look a little bit different because we need to differentiate between what is a bit and what is a qubit. So um, they will look something like this. So these are basically the same values, zero and one, but then on a, on a quantum computer. Um, by the way, on the previous slide, this one, um, this is actually if you combine multiple bits. So this is one bit that can be zero or one. Um, this is multiple bits. So this is a combined state um, of six bits. This is a, a these are the qubit states zero on the left hand side and one on the right hand side. And the reason we note it like this is because it's it's much harder to calculate with qubits if superposition comes into play. If you have a regular bit and you do operations on a regular bit, we as humans are smart enough to just figure it out in our heads. Um, so if you do one end gate one, you know that the result's going to be one. You can just um, make that up from the top of your head. But with quantum, we need to do some calculation and that calculation is based on linear algebra. Uh, so matri matrices. So the zero state on the left-hand side is a matrix uh, representing the zero state. Um, a way you can remember this matrix is the one is at index zero. <laughs> so the one is at index zero, so the top position index zero, which represents zero. And then on the right-hand side, the one is at index one, which represents one. Now, if you combine the qubit states together, um, you need to combine these two matrices uh, in, in linear algebra, you can do that using a tensor product. So if you do a tensor product between um, the same six um, bits as before, this is your resulting matrix. And it's very hard to work with matrices like this um, because they tend to grow uh, very large and they're vertically. So that's also not the way we want to read them. Um, so there was a mathematician called uh, Dirac and Mr. Dirac uh, created a, a notation specifically for this. Um, and now it looks a bit more like a, a regular bit. So on the left-hand side is the direct notation for a state zero in a qubit. And on the right-hand side is the one um, state for a qubit in the direct notation. And this also makes it a lot easier if you want to have a combined state and you want to write that down, you can just do it like we do before, but then just in the, in the Dirac notation. Um, so that's what a qubit looks like, but that's not the power in a qubit because now we still have the same thing. We just have a qubit that can be one or zero, but not the two in superposition. So what does a quantum state in superposition look like? It's kind of a, a, um, 
It's kind of a linear function that looks like this. It says some kind of number alpha times state zero plus some kind of number beta times the state one. So it's a linear combination between the state zero and one. So it's somewhere in between zero and one. Um, and then those alpha and beta, they need to, um, they need to be values that are uh, in line with the following um, formula. So the absolute value um, to the power of two plus the absolute value uh, of beta to the power of two needs to be one. Um, so you would say, okay, if you do to the power of two, why do you need to uh, take the absolute values? Well, alpha and beta are actually complex numbers. So a complex number is a number that has two uh, parts to it. So it has the real part in this, for alpha it's A, for beta it's C. So it's a real number. And then we add to that an imaginary number, um, which is in this case B for alpha and D for, for beta. Um, so those are complex numbers. So the state of a qubit in superposition is a linear combination between two um, complex values. So that's a, that's a lot of information stored in a single qubit, basically. Um, and if you put a qubit in superposition and it's, it's like 50% uh, state zero and 50% state one. So if your probability um, wave is 50-50, um, basically, then those alpha and beta values will actually be one over square root of two. Because one over square root of two, if you take the absolute value, it's one over square root of two. If you do that to the power of two, it's one over two. And then using this for, form, formula here, a half plus a half equals one. So this is perfectly valid for a superposition state. So this is what it looks like in maths. This is a superposition state for a qubit. And this is why we need the Dirac notation because now we can just easily um, write this down in a single line instead of a, a complex uh, vertical uh, matrix. So just to recap, we have a classical bit and we have a quantum bit that looks the same, but just in Dirac notation, so zero, zero. We have a classical bit one, which looks the same in a Dirac notation can also be one, but then a quantum bit in superposition, and this is where the power from uh, quantum comes from, um, is a linear combination um, that's between those two states and those alpha and beta values are complex numbers. Very important when a, a qubit is in superposition, the moment that we actually measure it, so the moment that we, at the end of our algorithm, we're going to look at the value, it will collapse to zero or one. So it's not in superposition anymore. Um, we made it collapse by just looking at it. And then it's going to be zero or one. It's going to use alpha and beta to decide if it's going to be alpha or beta based on a probability. Um, so if it's 50, 50, 50% 50 chance is going to be zero, 50% chance is going to be one. So I always like to make an example for, uh, of superposition with uh, USBs. So if you have a, a USB connector, like uh, the, old, the old school one, like this one, you want to put it in your, in your uh, PC, it's always in superposition, always. You, you, you try to, to put it in, it doesn't work. You turn it around, try to put it in, it doesn't work. You keep on trying this for a couple of times, you can't get it in. You look at it and then it decides what your orientation is like, it chooses one of the orientations and then you can just plug it in. It's, it's the same thing with, with qubits. The moment you look at it, it decides if it's zero or one. Um, just to, to make things hopefully a little bit more clear, um, just look, at the left-hand side of the slide and not the right-hand side. So the right-hand side looks like math. It is math. It looks very complicated. Don't bother with that. Um, just look at the left-hand side. This is what they call a block sphere. And this sphere can actually represent the state of a single qubit. So a single qubit. And it's a sphere. It's a three-dimensional sphere. And in this sphere, we have three axes. We have the x-axis going to coming towards us. We have the y-axis going off to the right, and we have the z-axis going to the top. Um, and as you can see, the two states, zero and one, they are actually on the z-axis. So zero points up and one points down. So if a qubit is in state zero, it's basically a vector uh, in three-dimensional space that points up. And you can actually make this vector by combining the two um, in, uh, the two uh, complex numbers, alpha and beta, from the formula before. Why a complex number has two uh, parts to it um, that can be plotted on an x and, uh, x and y axis. Um, if you combine two complex numbers, you can actually plot a vector in three-dimensional space, and that's exactly what the state of a single qubit can be. <clears throat> So if you change the state of a qubit, it's basically an arrow inside of that sphere that's going to rotate around the center and it's going to point somewhere 
on the surface of that sphere. Um, so basically, if you put a qubit in superposition, the arrow will not point up or down. It will point somewhere on the plane that you can see using the dashed line. So that plane is like halfway across the sphere, which is superposition, which means the moment you observe it, the moment you look at it, it collapses with a probability of 50-50 to the top or to the bottom. Um, the cool thing about quantum state is a single qubit has a very complex state. Again, it's a linear combination of two complex numbers. But then if you start adding qubits together, those states become a lot more complex. If you have a two qubit system, in total, you're going to have four values. You're going to have alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, so now you have four complex numbers. And here the power of quantum comes to light. Um, if you add a single qubit, the number of complex um, values inside of your states actually doubles. So you only need to add a single qubit to double the power of your state. So basically, if you think about a classical computer, a, class a classical CPU, it exists out of transistors. And we all know there's uh, hundreds of millions, even billions, uh, billions of transistors inside of a single CPU. Um, in this specific case, it would mean if we only add one transistor to that, we would double the power of our CPU. And that's not the case for classical computers. We need to double the amount of transistors to double the amount of uh, power we can have. But for a quantum system, we only need to add one qubit to the number of qubits we have to double the power. And this is where the exponentiality um, comes. And this is why we hope to be able to solve exponential problems, because we can also increase the power of a quantum system exponentially by just adding one qubit. Um, just like a classical computer, we can do operations on bits um, or on qubits. So a classical compu uh, computer uh, can do like an end gate or an OR gate or a NOT gate or many other gates. For a quantum computer, it's exactly the same, but we have different kinds of gates. Um, we can look at, the, at this sphere, the block sphere, and the block sphere will actually show the change in state on a qubit. So an X gate is a very uh, simple gate. It's like a NOT gate for classical computing. So if you have a state of uh, zero, um, you just rotate the vector around the X axis to become the one state and vice versa. So you can transfer from zero to one and from one to zero very easily using the X gate. Because the state of a single qubit can be written down as a matrix, this operation also has a matrix and you can use linear algebra to actually make out uh, the result by just multiplying the state matrix with this operation matrix. So if you multiply the state with this, the result state would actually be um, the representation of your of your qubit state. So again, um, it becomes hard to do in your head. Um, so by using these matrices and doing some calculation on a piece of paper, you can actually make out um, the result from that. There's other gates also. There's Y and Z gates to do the same transformation 180 degrees around um, respectively the Y and the Z axis. Um, these are the matrices that you can use um, to do that, these specific operations by hand. So for the Y gate, you're going to use I because complex numbers and basically you want your uh, vector to point in the right di direction. And for the Z gate, it's the uh, it looks like an identity matrix, but it has minus one uh, in the bottom right hand side. Then there's some more uh, interesting gates. There's the H gate or Hadamard gate. And this is a very important gate. This one puts a qubit in superposition or takes it out of superposition. Um, so if you have st state zero, for example, it will actually rotate around the Z and the X axis at the same time, um, actually a, di a di diagonal axis. Um, and it will put the um, the state vector on that plane that I told you about before, and now it's halfway in between one and zero. So it's basically in a uh, in an, uh, a perfect superposition where it's 50% zero, 50% uh, one. So it's a probability um, wave that has 50-50 chances of collapsing to zero or one. So that's an Hadamard gate. Again, the matrix uses the one over square root of two values because if you use those values, you have a half plus a half equals one. Then there's also gates for multiple qubits. So there's a controlled not gate, which actually means that you need two qubits. So basically, if one qubit um, is one, the other qubit will be flipped. Um, if your uh, control qubit is zero, your other qubit will not be flipped. This is the matrix you need uh, for that. And the reason the matrix is larger, it's, it's a larger dimension matrix, is because a combined state for two qubits is basically a matrix with four vertical values. 
And then there's the Toffoli gate, um, which is the same as a controlled knot, but it's a controlled controlled knot, so it needs three qubits. So again, three qubits, if you combine the state of three qubits, you get eight um, values uh, on top of each other, and you need to multiply that with this matrix to get the uh, final result. And then there's many more gates, but these are the, 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 the most useful gates we will use in our examples um, today. So let's get down to actually doing some quantum. Um, two things today, there's IBM Q experience and there's uh, Microsoft Q Sharp. So let's start in IBM because it's very, um, it's very uh, presentable, it's very visual. So IBM has a cloud service where you can run uh, your algorithms on top of the, their real quantum computers. So they have a list of quantum computers on the right hand side. Um, and they have, like, for example, this one has 15 qubits, this one has five qubits, five qubits, five qubits, five qubits. Uh, most of them have five qubits. So five cu qubits is good for experimentation. 15 qubits is good for experimentation, but it's not, it's not a lot of qubits. We need lots more qubits to do really complex uh, problems, but we are not yet able to create a physical quantum computer that is stable enough to handle lots of qubits because um, basically, IBM is using, I think, electrons. Um, those electrons, they can't interfere with our reality. So they need to put them far away from each other in a vacuum, and they need to cool cool it down to uh, zero degrees, uh, zero Kelvin, not zero degrees Celsius, but zero Kelvin, which is like minus 270 degrees Celsius. Um, just to make sure that if they put a qubit in superposition, that it stays in superposition, because it, they, they are very fragile. If you put a qubit in superposition and it comes into contact with anything else, it will very quickly lose its superposition again. Um, so that's why we only have computer systems running that have uh, a low number of qubits, because it's still very hard for us to find a perfect uh, physical implementation that actually works stable enough. Um, yeah. So. When I create a new experiment, they will actually give me um, a whole lot of gates that I can use, and they give me five qubits. So five qubits numbered from zero to four. And then there's lines, and on these lines, is that's basically a timeline. So on that timeline, I can do operations on top of a qubit. So this is called a circuit. So your algorithm is basically a circuit, um, just like we 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 did long time ago when when we have big big buttons that can have zero or one we also created circuits so that's the level where quantum computing is today building circuits so if i for example put the first qubit through an Hadamard gate i'm going to put it in superposition um, i'm just going to save this i'm going to run it i'm going to run it on a simulator not on a on a, on a real quantum computer why because it takes a, a a couple of minutes on a real quantum computer because there's like a line of people in front of me uh the whole world is experimenting with this um so if i create a simulator it will it will only take me a couple of seconds um also because it's quantum and it's based on a probability um wave function um it's going to run this experiment multiple times for me because if I put a qubit in superposition, and if I, uh, which is something I forgot basically, when I observe it, when I measure the final end result of that, I'm going to translate the qubit into a regular bit, which is going to be one or zero. I need to run it multiple times to actually know how, how much my percentage of one and how much my percentage of zero would actually be. So I'm going to run it a thousand times. So when you click run, you need to wait for a couple of seconds. It will run your circuit a, 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 a thousand times. And then when you look at the result, you will see a graph. And this graph will actually represent the probability your final end state was zero is 50.391. And the probability of your final state being one is 49.609%. So it's not entirely 50-50 because it's, it's real life. It's never going to be 50-50 unless we run the experiment an infinite amount of times. We only ran it a thousand times, and when you run it a, th a thousand times, you're only going to approach the probability of 50%. So, but it's about 50% basically. Um, again, the state is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 because we have five qubits, but we only used the the we only used the top qubit, so it's the the one in the end, and here it's the zero zero in the end. So that's what uh, that's basically what um, what uh, IBM Q looks like so you can just drag and drop your circuit and then you can experiment with the final end results 
So before I show you another example, let's let's quickly um, do the same thing in uh, Q Sharp. So Q Sharp is a language from Microsoft. Um, they created a new programming language that can do the same thing as IBM does using the same operations, um, but it's more of a scripting language. By the way, um, IBM is also a scripting language. Behind this is also a programming language and you can use that. So you don't need to do everything graphically. You can also type code, but I, I think it's fun to show um, to an audience. So in Q-Sharp, you don't have the visual representation. Um, you need to install the what they call the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. It will install um, the programming lang language on top of .NET. So it's basically on top of .NET Core. Um, and then you can use .NET Core to run or simulate your actual algorithms. So on the IBM Q experiments, you can run your uh, circuit on a real quantum computer. Uh, Microsoft has created Q-Sharp and that can also be run on a real quantum computer, but Microsoft is still working on that. So I, I think they announced on Build a couple of uh, weeks ago that they will release Azure Quantum in preview somewhere, I don't know, maybe this year. So I'm looking forward to that. And then you will also have the opportunity to run your Q-Sharp uh, algorithms on top of a real quantum computer. But today they are simulated using um, .NET Core. So in this case, I'm going to create a Q-Sharp project in Visual Studio Code. So I have uh, installed all the templates and the quantum development kit. So I can create a new project. I can create a standalone console application because that's what .NET Core can basically do. I'm going to call my uh, project the quantum project. It's going to just be a regular uh, .NET Core project. And inside of that project, there's going to be um, two files, the, your uh, project file itself, and then your quantum uh, file. So Q sharp QS, which is your quantum um, uh, source code. So you can create an operation or a circuit. You can have multiple operations that can call each other, but this is a very simple circuit. Um, and I can basically do the same as what I did in, um, in IBM Q. So I'm going to ask Q sharp for a qubit. So I need only one qubit. So I'm going to do using, which we know from C sharp. We're going to use and then dispose of it later, um, a qubit, which equals a qubit like this. So this is how you ask Q sharp for a new qubit. Now we have that qubit and we can put that qubit through the Hadamard gate like this. So it's just calling the function H and giving that qubit as a parameter to H. So now that qubit is in superposition and now I can measure it. So I can do um, let B, so B stands for a bit. So this is going to be a, a bit value equals the measurement of Q. So Q is a qubit and B is a bit. And when I do a measurement on Q, I'm going to collapse that qubit, which was in superposition to be either zero or one. And I'm going to store the result in a variable called B. Um, Q sharp has the need that you always reset your qubit. So if your qubit is in state one, you always need to reset it to state zero. So they have a reset operation for that. And then I can show a message on the console basically that will show me the final end result of my uh, bit if it's going to be zero or one. So I'm going to very quickly do like a, a using or an open of the convert namespace. And I'm going to do bool to string, you no know, bool s string to convert a boolean to a string and my Boolean value is inside of the B. So actually B is not of type Boolean, B is of type result and result can either be one or zero. So I'm going to convert that to a Boolean by uh, comparing it to one. So if B equals one, then the result will be true, which is a Boolean. That's it. So now um, view, where's my terminal? .NET run will make this console application run this um, Q-sharp algorithm and it will simulate it. It will take some time the first time. So this is exactly the same as we did before, but here we have more power um, because we can do uh, standard stuff, like we can do loops, we can do if statements and stuff like that, um, which I think is, is, is rather cool. So the result is false. But of course, sometimes it will be true, sometimes it will be false. If I want to run it multiple times, I can do like a for loop for i in 0 to 10 to do it 10 times. Um, so it, it looks more like a functional language. If you're used to C sharp, it actually looks uh, a bit more like uh, F sharp. So 
this will actually run the same thing 10 times. And now you will see it's going to be true, false, true, true, false, false, whatever, um, which is uh, random. If we have true quantum computers, this is actually a truly uh, random generated value. So if you re if you need true randomness, um, quantum computing can can offer that to you because uh, superposition qubit collapsing is actually true randomness. Of course, we're now running this in a simulated environment, so. In the in the in the end, it's going to be pseudo random, uh, but this is this is basically that. All right. So this was uh, IBM and Microsoft Q. Um, the next thing I want to show you is the entanglement because we can create a circuit that actually does entanglement very easily. Um, the circuit looks like this. We have two qubits. Um, we put a single qubit through a Hadamard gate, so we put it in superposition. And now this qubit is in superposition and it's one and zero at the same time. And then we use a controlled NOT gate. So this is a controlled NOT gate. Um, it basically will flip the top qubit from zero to one or one to zero. It's like a NOT gate or an X gate, uh, basically, only if the bottom qubit is one. But the bottom qubit is not one and it's not zero. It's one and zero at the same time or it's in superposition. Um, so that controlled NOT gate will actually make those two qubits entangled. And entangled means if the bottom one is one, the top one will always be one from the moment you measure it. So just before we measure it, they are both in like superposition um, because we link them together. They are um, entangled together. It's only when we observe them that they will both decide their value at the same time. Doesn't really matter where they physically are. If we have one here and one on Mars, um, and we observe the one on Mars, the one on Earth will have the same value immediately. Um, so we can do this in, in, in Q sharp um, by just changing this a little bit. So I don't need one qubit, but I need a tuple of two qubits. So Q1 and Q2. I'm going to, I'm going to be very original with my uh, namings. So this is how you create two qubits. I'm going to put the first qubit in superposition, not the second one. And then I'm going to apply the C not gate to the Q1 and the Q2, where the Q1 is the controlled uh, qubit. So Q1 will be the control and Q2 will be the, the target. Then we're going, to, we're going to create two bits by measuring both of the values from the two qubits. So B1 and B2. We're going to reset the two qubits So that when we uh, dispose of them and give them back to uh, Q sharp or the simulator that they are back in their original state, basically. And then we can uh, print the message containing the two values, which is basically B1 equals zero and B2 equals zero, like that. And if we run this now, we will have 10 um, qubit, 10 times two qubits, and the values of those two qubits should always be the same. They're going to be random, but they will always be the same. See, so now we have true, 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 then it's false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true. So they are entangled. They will always be equal. Um, of course, this is a simulated environment, so not, not a very cool experiment, but it's that's the concept of a, that's going to also work on a real uh, quantum computer. And the reason that they are entangled can actually be proven by looking at this mathematically. So I, I, I told you guys, um, that you can use uh, matrices to do the actual calculations. So if you do that and you go through it, I'm not going to do it um, in detail now because we only have one hour. Um, but when you do that, you can look at the slides later on. Um, you will see that the resulting state of those two qubits in a single uh, matrix looks like this. And we know that it's a combined state. So we know it's a tensor product between the two separate states. And if you know how to calculate a tens tensor product, you know that the top position is A times C, the second position is A times D, the third position is B times C, and the uh, bottom position is B times D. And if you look at the values, then you can see that AD or BC are zero, which means that either A or D is zero or B or C is zero. And that just can't happen because AC needs to be one over square root of two, but either A or C is zero. So this, this will never work. So mathematically here we're stuck. And why are we stuck? Because those two qubits are entangled. 
um, the state of those two qubits cannot be taken apart. They will always live together because we just don't have an option to tear them apart, basically. Um, then there's something else called teleportation based on, on this. I'm not going to show you the, the, the implementation for this, but I have a GitHub page and I will show you the link uh, later um where the presentation is and where all the q sharp code is and this this is implemented in q sharp right there so you can just have a look basically thanks to uh entanglement and qubits we can actually teleport a state from a qubit to a different qubit so here we have three qubits the top qubit contains uh, some kind of state we don't know what and then there's two people alice and bob and they also have a, a two uh, a qubit each and basically, Alice has access to the message, but Bob does not. So Alice can be in Oslo and Bob can be in Australia. Alice has the message, Bob does not. Um, and they can actually use a quantum circuit that looks exactly like this. It's no more complicated than this to transfer the state from this qubit on top of the qubit from Bob by first entangling, entangling um, the qubits from Alice and Bob together and they are not on the same physical location. So how would they do that? Well, they would buy some kind of qubit pair um, off of the internet that's been entangled together beforehand. And then one is sent to Alice and one is sent to Bob. So those are entangled, they stay entangled. Um, then Alice has a message to send. So she entangles that message to her qubit. Then she does some operations. She she me she, me she measures the values of her own qubit and of that the message. She picks up the phone. She talks to Bob and she says, "Bob, um, my qubit has state zero, so you have to apply the X gate to your qubit. And if my message has the state one, or collapsed to one, um, you have to." put your qubit through the Z gate. And if that happens, the final end result of Bob's qubit is the exact same state as the one that uh, Alice started out with. So the state is actually teleported. Um, it, it's not very quickly because you still have to pick up the phone and actually talk to each other, but you can have that complex state actually transferred from one qubit to another, which is crazy. And then to, to basically end my presentation, um, if you're looking uh, into this, there's already many algorithms all, um, created um that actually solve real life problems and you can actually dig deep into those by using q sharp uh, microsoft also has a lot of examples in q sharp for all of these kinds of algorithms so you can learn to do quantum by just looking uh, at these algorithms and trying them out yourself so there's deutsch um which, which was actually the first quantum algorithm that actually made sense in 1985 um it's not useful but it makes sense it's not useful. The only thing that it's useful for is to prove that a quantum algorithm can be twice as fast as a classical algorithm. So it actually um, takes a very specific problem that takes two operations on a classical computer and only one operation on a quantum computer, just proving that a, that a quantum algorithm can be twice as fast uh, or quite twice as powerful than a classical computer. So this was the first algorithm that actually made sense. And then they, they thought by themselves, okay, we know that quantum can really be a thing we need to investigate further. Um, then he worked together with uh, another scientist called uh, Jossa. They just created a, an, an, a bigger version of their algorithm that not only works for a one bit uh, problem, but also for multiple n bits. Um, then there's Grover's algorithm. This is a quite, quite uh, popular one. It's like searching a database. Uh, and it comes down to when you have an, a number of values inside of a database, when you need to find a value from that um, on a classical way, you need to visit all of the items in the database. You need to look at all of them until you actually find it. So the, the order of complexity is always going to be N. So if you have more items, it will take you longer to find um, an item in that list. On a quantum computer, thanks to Grover's algorithm, we can do this more quickly. Grover's algorithm can find an item in a list of items um, in an order of complexity of square root of n. So it's exponential, exponentially faster and it doesn't need to visit all of the items at the same time, but it is probabilistic. It will tell us, I think, with 80% certainty that this value is the value you're searching for. But that's not if, if it's only 80%, that's really, it's not a problem because we can just have a classical algorithm next to that that just looks at the value. And if it's not the one we are searching for, we can just try again. And even when running Grover's algorithm in multiple iterations, it's still uh, exponentially faster than it is by doing it classically. And then the last one I want to show you is Shor's algorithm. 
um, or I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, it's about prime factorization of in large integer integers. So it's basically the, the, the security thing that I talked uh, before about. So if you have a very large number, if you need to factorize that in its original prime factors, Shor's algorithm actually works and it's also exponentially fast um, in doing that. But today, if we run that on a physical quantum computer, we don't have enough qubits to actually use it for very large numbers. We can use um, quantum computers today to do it on smaller numbers. So if you say, for example, 21, Shor's algorithm can tell you that that is uh, seven times three uh, very quickly. But of course, that really doesn't make any sense for us. But the algorithm is there. It is scalable, um, but we just don't have the physical um, implementation of a quantum computer yet that is stable enough to, to run this algorithm, but the algorithm is perfectly uh, workable. So with that is uh, a whole explanation of the Deutsch algorithm because uh, the Deutsch algorithm is the algorithm that actually made me really understand how quantum works by just looking at the circuit, trying to do the circuit in Q sharp myself, but also writing it down on a piece of paper using the math, so using the linear algebra. So by just trying all the states and just looking what happens made me really realize what is going to what is happening uh, in the back in the back end of this algorithm. Um, so I encourage you to look at this. Um, there's many YouTube videos, there's many papers online where you can actually look into what the Deutsch algorithm is all about. It's a very it's it's simple. You can you can understand it very easily. If you if you're going to start with uh, Shor's algorithm, for example, you're going to have a bleeding nose um for sure so start with something simple start with deutsch so in my slides i have the the whole explanation of deutsch we don't have the time to go over it just uh, right now but you can do that um, in your own time and with that it's basically four o'clock so my hour is is finished um, you can always ask me questions in slack i'll be on slack um for a couple of uh, for for some time um you can send me an email on my company email you can contact me on twitter and i also have a github page um, that has a specific repository for today and this contains uh, five or six examples uh, in q sharp for teleportation for uh, deutsch is also implemented there so you can have a look right there uh, and with that i would like to say thank you i'm very uh, sorry that i can't see you in person but yeah that's what we are what we are doing so thanks